next on Unsolved Mysteries. When a woman suddenly disappears, her husband claims that she ran away, but the police believe he killed her. Tanya Kobrick wanted to break up with her boyfriend, but he didn't like that idea and responded with a murderous rage. A little girl and her mother are found dead 12 miles apart. Who murdered them and why? And many people believe they have been cured by Father Solanus Casey. Is he truly a miracle worker? Sound intriguing? You better believe it. These are unusual cases that you won't want to miss. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Johnston, Rhode Island. Stephen Marfio comes home from work Maureen. to find that his house is oddly silent. Maureen. A small suitcase is missing. So is Doreen, Stephen's wife of 12 years. I started looking for the clothes. I noticed some jeans, a couple of shirts were missing, blouses. I checked the small safe that we used to have and I noticed that there's some money out of it. There was probably a few hundred in there that was gone. Other than that, there was the car was in the yard. Uh, there were no notes, no letters, nothing. Since the day she disappeared, there have been several unconfirmed sightings of Doreen Marfio. But beyond that, nothing. No phone calls, no paper trail, no body. Doreen just vanished. The police are now convinced that she was murdered. And Stephen Marfio has now discovered that when someone disappears, the prime suspect is often the person who knew them best. Stephen and Doreen Marfio had similar outgoing personalities and both loved the outdoors. They seemed like the perfect match. But 11 years into their marriage, a crack appeared in their perfect world. Doreen suddenly quit her job and said that she needed a change. It was a surprise to her bosses as well as myself and her friends and mother. You just don't quit a job and not go anywhere. She's not the type to just leave for no reason. According to Stephen, Doreen's behavior grew more and more erratic. She seemed to be on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Maureen, do you know what time it is? I know, I know. Um, look, just go back to bed. I'll be there in a couple of minutes, okay? From a strong, independent woman, she became very weak, very unassured of herself, uh, basically a nervous wreck in a matter of weeks. Is it me? Is it something no, I did? No, it's When I did you. try and push the issue, she would get more hysterical. We always could talk about everything before. Why not now? She said, it's, I can't at this time. I will tell you, but I can't at this time. And I never did find out. Hi, is, is Doreen there? Stephen admits that he did nothing for two days after Doreen vanished, assuming that she needed some time alone to sort things out. Finally, he called Doreen's mother. She hadn't seen or talked to her daughter in a week. I really think she went away to get a few days by herself to clear her head. When Steve called me in the morning, he sounded strange. I said, there's something wrong. Then he called the afternoon right away. I knew. I, I told him, call the police now. Don't wait. The police questioned Doreen's family and friends, but no one knew why she may have left. And then detectives made a startling discovery. I just called Stephen Mafio back. He said he had Doreen followed around by two private investigators for like 11 months. So I did hire a private investigator on and off for a year, maybe a few hours a month to follow her once in a while because I didn't know what was going on. I just felt that there was something wrong, but they never found anything. 
Basically, what you have is you have a man who has a personality, who has his wife followed around for 11 months for no reason at all. And this same man, later on down the road, his wife disappears, she's missing for two days. And you don't think anything unusual? You don't, you don't make any phone calls or call the police? It's not consistent. Two and a half months after Doreen disappeared, police got their first break in the case when they received two anonymous letters. In one, the author accused Doreen of cheating on her husband. It said, Although on the outside she personifies class, beauty, and professionalism, in reality, she is nothing more than a cheap harlot. Her promotions were achieved by her sexual prowess rather than management or leadership abilities. We talked to co-workers. There was absolutely no inclination of Doreen having an affair with anyone. Her co-worker says that was totally out of her character. Uh, she had mentioned just a normal conversation with her co-workers that that's something she would never be involved in or tolerate was any type of marital affairs, even long before she disappeared. However, according to her sister, Doreen had considered leaving Stephen for another man early in their marriage. She was having an affair, and the guy that she was having the affair with was leaving or wanted to have her leave with him to wherever he was going. She was pretty worried and very upset about what she should do. And she came to me and eventually to my husband to talk about it. And we all decided that probably the best thing she should do was not, <laughs> not do what she was thinking of doing. The second letter was even more disturbing than the first. It gave a chilling account of how Stephen Marfio had allegedly murdered his wife. Stephen got hot under the collar. He made for couch and strangled Doreen. On a narrow dirt road, he stopped and deposited wife's body in reeds in a pond. Police sent the letters to an expert on psycholinguistics for evaluation. Well, it's got to be of someone who knew Doreen quite well, close to uh, the family, the Marfios. And then one says uh, that the easiest and simplest account of this was it was designed to deceive the authorities. In his report, Dr. Myron concluded that Marfio probably wrote both letters and was, quote, the logical suspect in the murder of his wife. I did not type any letters. They're police. They can say whatever they want. And they do, and they get away with it. But I'm really getting tired of the accusations and the allegations. Anyone knows. If you have something, bring it forward. The police seized several typewriters which Stephen could have used to type the letters. A comparison of type styles revealed that the first letter had been written on a typewriter belonging to one of Stephen's close relatives. It establishes for the first time uh, a linkage between the document, the instrument, and a suspect. So it was a major importance to us. And I mean, it's, it's like a fingerprint as far as identification. Everybody calls me an optimist, and everybody says, oh, Steve Keller. But I don't believe that at all. Uh, none of his friends do as well, the ones that I know that I've talked to. Uh, I myself don't. The police do, but there is no evidence. Today, Stephen Marfio lives in the same house that he and Doreen shared for 12 years. The police still believe Doreen didn't leave voluntarily, partly because she left $50,000 in a joint savings account untouched. But without a body, it is difficult to prove that a crime has ever been committed. I had nothing to do with my wife's disappearance, nor do I know where she is. I would like to think that she's still alive. But I, I do feel that it's possible it could go the other way too. But I want to know that she is alive. Update. Nine years after Doreen disappeared, this case took another unexpected turn. Stephen Marfio fatally shot an ex-girlfriend, wounded her boyfriend, and then committed suicide. He left a suicide note stating that ever since his wife's disappearance, he had been, quote, just the shell of a man faking that I'm okay. 
Shortly after Marfio's death, police searched his property for Doreen's body, but they found nothing. Investigators believe that Doreen Marfio is dead, but her family is still searching for answers. If you have any information about this case, please contact us at unsolved.com. Next, when a pharmacy student is kicked out of school, he snaps and turns his rage on the woman who once loved him. Kansas City, Missouri. On a fall evening, police respond to reports of a shooting. It is immediately clear that the female victim is dead. Soon, investigators learn her identity. Tanya Koprik had emigrated from Yugoslavia to study medicine in the United States. She was determined to beat the odds to build a career and a life in a new country. And by the age of 34, Tanya had achieved her goal. She was a doctor at a Kansas City hospital. She had also found someone to share her successful life with. Richard Bockridge seemed like the perfect guy at first. Richard was a pharmacy student at the University of Missouri. He was young and dynamic and quite attentive to Tanya. Soon after they met, he moved into her apartment. Six months later, Richard proposed and Tanya accepted. But her friends weren't so sure it was the perfect match. I did not really like him because he using her financially and morally. She was using her for a lot of things, like using her master's charge card and was kind of using car and using everything. Richard spent more and more time with Tanya and less time in class. He was on his way to flunking out. He was not real motivated. He wanted it. He wanted to be a pharmacist. But you have to want it bad enough to devote many, many hours to the academic study end of it. University officials notified Richard that he had been expelled. Richard begged Tanya to use her connections to get him readmitted. Tanya, come here. you gotta help me do no. this. You must help yourself. Help myself? How am I gonna do that if I'm not in school? I won't do it. Come on. I was thinking maybe he's still under drugs or alcohol because his behavior was changing. He was kind of a wild person. I can't find my electric razor. After a few weeks of Richard's increasingly erratic and sometimes violent behavior, Tanya broke off their engagement and kicked them out of her apartment. Two weeks later, Richard returned to class, pretending that he had not flunked out, but university officials refused to accept him back. Uh, Richard, I need to talk to you for a minute. Sure. Could we go out in the hallway? Take up with the admissions Look, board. I know I last quarter I had a little trouble, but I'm trying now. Richard, have to this doesn't have anything to do with your grade. Fine. Nothing to find. Fine. Richard, there's a, there's a proper procedure. Uh, okay. Richard wrote to the admissions office begging school officials to reconsider his case. His appeal was denied, and a secretary was ordered to call him with the news. At 3.45, right after Richard got the call denying his request, two professors saw him driving towards the dean's office. They immediately headed in the opposite direction. Hey, excuse me, have you seen Professor Strickland? Sorry, I haven't seen Richard him roamed the hallways searching for the dean of admissions. Under his arm, he carried a large manila folder. Some witnesses thought that it hit a weapon. Dean in? No, he's not. Uh, when will he be back? I'm not sure he's coming back today. I'll just wait for him, okay? Okay. Three hours later, Tanya returned to her apartment after work.
By the time police and paramedics arrived, Tanya Copert was dead. She had been shot three times in the head with a 45 caliber semi-automatic. I, I came out and then I heard the first gunshot. And I turned. There was a witness at the scene. And she saw this man walk up to the side of the doctor's car and shoot her three times in the face. She recognized him as being the man that dated Dr. Coper, Richard Bocklich. Later during the investigation, we found out that Mr. Bocklage had purchased a 45 caliber handgun himself. Six days later, Royal Canadian Mounted Police found Bocklage's car. Richard was seen by two people in the area. He then dropped from sight. I personally think he's back in the United States. I think he would have gotten tired of being that far north with no family. And that's, that's not his style. His style was a little bit faster, a little flashier, a little looser. And that might have been OK for a year or two, but I think he's back. Two months after Tanya was murdered, her parents in Yugoslavia notified police that they had received an unsigned letter postmarked two days before the murder. The envelope was addressed in Richard Bocklich's handwriting. Dear Koprik family, your daughter, Tanya Koprik, has been executed in Kansas City, Missouri. She has caused so much grief, anguish, and turmoil to so many Americans that this act was necessary. Her execution was inevitable. Richard Bocklage is wanted for capital murder. Authorities believe he may be living in Canada. He is six feet tall and weighs 170 pounds. He has vertical scars under each armpit where he had sweat glands removed. If you have any information about Richard Bocklage, please contact us at unsolved.com. Next, when a young girl is murdered, her mother is considered a suspect until she, too, is found dead. Boonville, Missouri. I'll see you tomorrow. Make sure she takes her It had been a routine Monday at Riverdale Care Center. 43-year-old nurse's aide, Janice Owen, a widow and mother of two, finishes her shift and then heads for home just a half a block away. It's just after 2 p.m. About an hour later, Janice's eight-year-old daughter, Alyssa, is on her way home. She is riding alone. Her older brother had been dropped off earlier at the babysitter's house. She's a cute little smiling girl. I just noticed her when she got off the bus and walked in front of my bus to get on her property. I watched her angle toward the front door of this residence, and then I was on my way. Later on Monday, Janice's mother stops by to say hello. Janice? I tried the door and it was unlocked. Janice? Hello? She didn't answer me, so I walked on through the house, and she wasn't anywhere to be found in there. Alyssa's coat is on the couch, her backpack on the floor. But Frances finds no sign of her daughter or granddaughter. It is now 5 p.m. So I wrote a note that I'd been there. And I thought it was funny that night she didn't call me, but there was nothing messed up or anything that would have given me any idea anything was wrong. 5.45 p.m. A neighbor returning home from work sees some unusual activity outside Janice's home. There was cars parked on the street that usually, I, I mean, I've just never noticed before. There was a woman on the porch, and there was a younger guy. He was wearing a red baseball cap. They were both facing the street, and they both stared at me as I drove by. Fifteen minutes later, 
the neighbor notices more strange activity outside of Janice's home. There was a white four-door car in front of her house, but on the wrong side of the street. And I saw a different guy facing me, looking down towards my end of the street. My intuition was telling me there's something wrong. The next morning, the start of a routine workday. On the outskirts of Fayette, Missouri, just 12 miles from Boonville, three employees of a local sawmill notice something on the side of the road. At first, they thought it was a mannequin. It turned out to be the lifeless body of a young child. Minutes later, the Howard County Sheriff arrived on the scene. There was no signs of any trauma or anything, so we called the coroner and he arrived and, and could determine that she'd probably been, you know, at least dead six to eight hours. And well over Sheriff Paulson, Howard County Sheriff's Department. With no reports of any missing children in their area, no Sheriff Paulson contacted Boonville Police in neighboring so Cooper County. Yeah, I'll check it out and I'll call you back as soon as I know anything. Okay. Detective Bob Williver made calls to several schools and soon had an answer. Alyssa Owen had been absent that day. It was her body discarded at the side of the road. 12.15 p.m., Detective Welliver drove over to deliver the terrible news to Alyssa's mother. No answer, suspicious, he went inside. Hello? Anybody home? There was no sign of Janice Owen. I didn't see anything out of the ordinary that would give me any suspicions that there was a struggle, no signs of any blood, no signs of any kind of uh, uh, any trauma or anything. We did not see anything out of the ordinary at the house. An autopsy revealed Alyssa had been suffocated. Now her mother was not only missing, but she was also the prime suspect in the murder of her daughter. But police had no motive. According to friends, Janice adored her daughter. Boonville Police Department. Detectives canvassed the area for clues. A neighbor reported seeing an older model dark colored pickup truck parked near Janice's home Monday afternoon. Then an employee with a local waste disposal company said he saw a similar pickup truck on the same road where Alyssa was found just minutes before the sawmill workers discovered her body. And as he went by, he was going slow, and I looked at him, and he was looking at me, so I waved, and he didn't turn his head away or wave or nothing, just stared and just kept right on going. And the guy was wearing a red ball cap. The witness couldn't see into the bed of the pickup truck, but he thinks he knows what was there, the body of Alyssa Owen. Jeff was certain she had not been lying on the side of the road when he drove by minutes earlier. If they were dumped or they had to have done it after 8.30 because I was through there not, you know, there's no way what the spot she was laying that I would have missed seeing her. Was the man behind the wheel the same one seen at Janice's home on Monday? And was the dark green pickup truck parked near her home that afternoon the same one spotted near the crime scene Tuesday morning? Detectives searched for answers, but came up empty. Over the next month, they chased hundreds of other leads. Then, six weeks after Alyssa's death, Janice's body was discovered in a creek bed about 12 miles from where her daughter had been found. She'd been in the water quite a while, but there were no really serious signs of trauma that we could tell. Everything she had on from work were still there. Her rings and necklaces and earrings and even her eyeglasses were still on her head. The coroner determined that mother and daughter had both died of suffocation within hours of one another. More questions. Why was Alyssa's body left in plain sight while her mother's body was dumped in a remote creek bed 12 miles away? And who knew the maze of back roads that crisscrossed Howard County? 
Police have plenty of theories, but still no suspects. Yeah, I'll check it out. I would love to say I have it or that I have any clue. I am a law enforcement officer. I, I am a detective. My job is to leave the options open until I can prove the facts. And I, quite frankly, I don't know. Update. The man and woman seen outside the Owens home the day of the disappearance have been identified as 25-year-old Angela Mize and her 18-year-old husband, Eric. Angela Mize had worked at the care center where Janice Owen was a nurse's aide. She went to the police after she and her husband had a fight and told them that he had killed both Alyssa and her mother. Police learned that the couple had kidnapped Alyssa, used her for sexual gratification, and then killed her. Alyssa's mother was murdered because she was, quote, in the way. Eric and Angela Mize were charged with two counts of first-degree murder. They avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty and were sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. Next, some say Father Solanus Casey was a miracle worker in life as well as in death. Does he really have the power to heal? Detroit, Michigan. For more than 50 years, Father Solanus was a church receptionist and doorman, one of the lowest ranking priests in the Catholic hierarchy. Father Solanus was a man who really cared for people. And when people came to him with their worries and fears and pains, he had a way of simply giving them courage to live their life the way it was. Those whose lives were touched by Father Solanus claim that he was a miracle worker. Even today, some people still turn to Father Solanus for help when facing a medical crisis. I do believe my prayer to Father Solanus was answered. It's the first time my prayers have really been answered like that in such a dramatic way. I'm still in awe of what had happened. I, I have no other explanation for it. The mammogram was positive. There when David Whitcop's wife, Joanne, developed a lump in her breast, they immediately went to see a surgeon. I'd like to set it up as soon as possible. We were concerned whether uh, this density could be a cancer. We weren't sure what we were dealing with. So medically, you have to do a biopsy to see is it benign or malignant. David and Joanne arrived at the hospital and noticed a small prayer room. Inside hung a portrait of Father Solanus. I was very desperate uh, and I just prayed to Father Solanus that there would be no more surgery and, and uh, I just wanted Joanne not, not to have this, this kind of operation at all anymore. Joanne was wheeled into surgery and David prepared for a long, anxious David. wait. David? Joanne? I looked up and it was Joanne out in the hallway there. I thought, well, maybe they're taking her down for surgery now. Hello, Mr. Whitcomb. Hello, doctor. We did another series of x-rays on your wife. There's no sign of a mass. Well, what does that mean? It's over. David prayed to God that I wouldn't have surgery and his prayers were answered, even though a half hour before, it looked hopeless. And I believe that Solanus and God saw fit to have a healing that day. The medical term spontaneous remission describes sudden recoveries like Joanne Whitcops. But some see her recovery as just one more example of the miraculous healing powers of Father Solanus Casey. Bernard Casey was born in 1870, one of 16 brothers and sisters. At the age of 21, he decided to dedicate his life to the church. For Bernard, who had not even graduated high school, it was a struggle from the start. 
His classes were taught in German and Latin. Bernhard, hmm. verstehst du alles? Ja, Herr Professor, ich glaube so. Good. Father Solanus was one of these people who had difficulty remembering the question and answers and theology and so on. And as a result, he never really passed all the tests in the seminary days. Solanus almost flunked out, but a few of his superiors recognized his spiritual character and proposed a compromise. Solanus was ordained but he was not allowed to hear confession, preach a sermon, or teach the doctrine, all the most cherished duties of a priest. This was a rather humiliating thing, but I think he accepted it as God's will. And that act of humility then uh, made him more pleasing in God's sight, and so God could work great things through him. After his ordination in 1904, Father Solanus was sent to New York. Every day, he would greet worshipers at a church in Yonkers. Soon, it was Father Solanus that people came to see. Father Solanus was later transferred to St. Bonaventure's in Detroit. Parishioners lined up to see him, and Father Solanus was now regarded as a divine healer. Oh, doctor, thank goodness you're here. Good uh, where's the boy? Uh, right upstairs. The story of 12-year-old Charles Rogers is one of the most amazing. His sister Helen was eight years old at the time and remembers every detail. In 1935, we had the polio epidemic in Detroit. And at that time, my brother came down with a severe headache and stiffness of the neck that went down into his arms and legs. And eventually, he ended up with spasms. He would shake, his body would shake. Dr. Ronald Athey was one of Detroit's top polio specialists. It didn't take him long to make the diagnosis. What can we do? Nothing. Father Salamis. One of Father Mr. Salamis. Rogers' employees Pardon heard me. about Charles' symptoms and went straight to Father Salamis. Will you pray for him, Father? Please. Don't worry, he will be better tomorrow. Helen Gleason says that her brother underwent a miraculous transformation that very night. Dad? Mom? Charles? Charles, is that you? According to Helen, Charles recovered fully within a month. He lived to be 64 years old and was never again troubled by any symptoms of polio. Father Solanus Casey retired in 1956 at the age of 85 and died the following year. The streets around St. Bonaventure's filled with 10,000 mourners. It was one of the largest funerals in the city's history. 10 years later, Father Solanus was proposed as a candidate for sainthood. His body was exhumed to allow church officials to look for the signs of exceptional preservation that might validate canonization. While his hands and his face were somewhat darkened, the rest of his body was very natural looking. Following the ritual examination, the body of Father Solanus was placed in a special sanctuary within St. Bonaventure's. As he did in life, Father Solanus continued to inspire believers from around the world. To me, a lot of times, just myself praying to God, I need help. Or I might need an interpreter, if I can put it that way. And uh, uh, I, I think he does help people do that. Reverence for Father Solanus continues to grow. If he is canonized, he will be the first American-born male saint. Next, a family torn apart by violence is finally reunited.
Chillicothe, Missouri. Lori Magnan had just been adopted when she happened to see her new father cleaning a handgun. Lori was deeply upset by the scene, the first hint of a dark secret that had ripped apart her birth family. And I saw that, and I just said, that's what the policemen had when they come to get my daddy. At the age of four, Lori couldn't make any sense of the dim memory that included her birth father, a policeman, and a gun. It wasn't until she was an adult with a family of her own that Lori Magnan would fully understand the horror of her childhood. At the age of three, Lori had been adopted by Charles and Rita DeLorme. The court sealed Lori's records and only told her adoptive parents that she needed a stable home. But even within the safety of her new family, Lori began having nightmares. She appeared distant and distracted. Lori was probably about um, six or seven, and she was eating at the table one day, and she couldn't close her mouth. She would just leave her mouth open, and it really scared Mother, so she made an appointment with a therapist in a, another town and took her there, and they said that she had had um, a serious trauma and that it happened when she was fairly young. Lori's adoptive mother had no idea what was wrong with her little girl. As Lori grew older, she was haunted by a troubling sense that something awful had happened in her past. Eventually, Lori asked her mother for any paperwork concerning her adoption. I turned 16 and she brought the adoption papers out. She kept every letter. And this is, I'm gonna give this to you. Now's the time. And so I, I took them, I went over to Renee's house. I couldn't wait till she got there because we, we always had this dream we were gonna find her mom. And so when she came, we got up on the bunk bed and she opened up the papers. And that's when we found out that her mom was already dead. The adoption papers did not give a cause of death or mention any other siblings. And we were just like, oh my goodness. And Renee, we was like, well, we're just gonna try to find somebody here. And it didn't, uh, we didn't know where to go. We were too young. Lori moved on with her life. She grew up, married, and had three children of her own. But the vague memories of a past trauma persisted. Laurie needed to know the truth. So, so 56. Yeah. Finally, Laurie, her husband Donald, and their son searched a microfiche copy of the Kansas City Star for November 27, 1956, the day Laurie's mother had died. Okay, here we go. Slow down, slow down. Okay. I was scanning through the, the old papers and I came across this picture of four girls and a and a boy, and one of them was about Lori's age, would have been Lori's age, and uh, I said, Lori, could this possibly be your family? I said, this looks awful lot like you, the next to youngest one. And she looked at the picture, and she said, hey, yeah, that's me. In the photo, 14-month-old Lori sat next to her brother and three sisters, who ranged in age from three months to nine years. That's when I first time saw the picture of me and my brother and my sisters. First time, my first baby picture I've ever seen. Lori then started reading the article next to the photo. Lori Delorme Magnan had finally come face to face with the horrifying truth of her past. <laughs> when Lori's father, Alexander Camarina, arrived home drunk, Lori's mother was waiting for him. Alexander had made two purchases earlier in the evening, a box of chocolates and a 38 caliber handgun. They fought about the gun. Alexander claimed that it was broken and demonstrated by pointing the weapon at his wife's head. I don't care if he say you're sorry and all that. Uh, you just don't point a gun in someone's temple. I don't care. And that was my mom. 
and I will never see her again. Lori made a copy of the photo and took it home with her. I just went to the bedroom, took that picture with me. And I just stared at it. I just, just couldn't believe it. You know, I mean, me, my brother, my sisters, <laughs> and we all look alike. Wow, well, the dark hair and that. And the oldest girl, she's like looking off in a direction. She just looks so sad because she was old enough to remember. No! no. Lori's mother is buried under her maiden name in a Kansas City cemetery. Her father was convicted of second degree murder and sent to prison. He is now deceased. Just for you. My brother and my sisters, we lost both our parents now. And uh, I think they need me like I need them. And they may have their own families now like I do, but like I feel they must want to see me if they think about me. I don't know if they tried to find me, but I'm trying. Update. As the result of our broadcast, Laurie's cousin, Ruth Crook, contacted us. A friend had seen the show and told Ruth that her long lost cousin was looking for her birth family. It was um, a happy shock and very exciting to know that she had been found. Several weeks later, the family met for a long-awaited reunion. With her growing circle of family members, Lori Magnum is increasingly able to put her past losses to rest.